Genshin Impact is a game mostly known for basing its fictional nations off of the cultures and history of real-life countries. In my last Genshin video essay, I discussed how Middle Eastern, Arab, and Persian culture shaped the lore of the newest nation, Sumeru. However, Sumeru is a country that took inspiration from multiple parts of the world. So, in this video, I am here to discuss the North African culture and history that influenced Sumeru's world building. These comparisons include pre-Arab ancient Egypt, such as their burial traditions and pantheon of gods, the architecture and design inspired by Tunisia, as well as connections to the native Algerian Amazigh people. A ton of info will be covered in this video, so timestamps will be included in the description if you would like to skip to a specific part. With all that being said, please sit back and enjoy the video. For our first set of comparisons, let's start off with Egypt, since it is the country with the most representation in the Sumeru Desert. Of course, the first similarities between Sumeru and Egypt are a no-brainer. It's pretty obvious to most people that Sumeru's pyramids, especially King Deshret's mausoleum, were based on the Great Pyramids of Giza. This is especially true in the terms of their purpose. Most of us who at least attended 6th grade history know that the pyramids were built as graves for the dead kings or pharaoh of Egypt. In a similar manner, Sumeru's pyramids also act as burial grounds for their kings, especially King Deshret himself. However, if we wish to dive deeper in connecting Egypt's lore to Sumeru, we'll have to look under the surface and take a look at their traditions, specifically their burial traditions. During the Golden Slumber quest, we got to go inside King Deshret's mausoleum and take a look at his sarcophagus, which already has similar design to the ones used for Egyptian pharaohs. Upon examining his grave room, you may notice something unique about his burial site. King Deshret was buried alongside massive piles of his riches, as well as everyday luxuries, like a fan, and even containers of food and drink. But why is this so? The ancient Egyptians, like most cultures, had a belief of an afterlife. In their belief system, they thought that a king's afterlife was enjoyed when they took their riches with them. That is why, just like King Deshra, the ancient kings of Egypt would be buried with their wealth and favorite luxuries, in hopes of using them in the afterlife. Besides money, we also see other material things buried in the mausoleums and temples. One of them is a whole freaking boat. But why would a useful vessel such as this be buried for no one to use? This may be a reference to the Abydos boats and Khufu ship excavated in Egypt. Just like with money, scholars also believe that Egyptians thought that the pharaoh would need his boat to travel into the afterlife, hence why the ancient equivalent of a yacht would be included in his grave. In addition to this, we also encounter a room with a comically large jar said to house the organs of the deceased King Deshra. So why is it that the king's body was buried in a sarcophagus, but his organs placed in a separate container? This is a reference to the canopic jars used by ancient Egyptians. These were vases used in the famous mummification process. I mentioned earlier that Egyptians placed great emphasis in the afterlife, which is why they put riches and everyday commodities in their graves. However, you can't enjoy those riches in the afterlife if you don't have any functioning organs. That is why the canopic chars seen in Egypt and King Deshret's mausoleum are used, as an airtight seal would preserve and protect the vital organs such as intestines, heart, lungs, and liver from instant decay. That way, these dead kings could enjoy an afterlife with properly functioning organs. Even more similarities to ancient Egypt are found in smaller details across the Sumeru Desert. This is especially true for symbols that hold great value in Egyptian culture. The first example has to be hieroglyphs. This was the famous pictographic alphabet used by ancient Egyptians that most of us at least heard of. They seem to be the basis of inspiration for the Deshret script we see across Sumeru. However, it is their placement across these structures that connect them to Egypt. One of the major puzzles in Sumeru is to collect tablets for a primal obelisk. These obelisks not only have these hieroglyphs written on them, but are also built in the same manner and purpose as their Egyptian counterparts. This is because in ancient Egypt, obelisks were actually monuments used to revere and commemorate dead kings and gods, which is why we see the ones in Sumeru built right next to their mausoleums and temples. Furthermore, Egypt's obelisks were built specifically at the entrance of tombs, which is why we see the obelisks in Sumeru also dot the paths leading to the tombs of Deshret and his followers. For even more connections to ancient Egyptian symbols, let's take a look at Candace, as she is the character with perhaps the most references to Egyptian culture. During her idol animation, Candace seems to pray with a cross. This Egyptian symbol is known as an Ankh, which represents the concept of protection from divine or godlike forces. This is very fitting for someone like Candace, as not only is she the protector of Aru village, but also possesses divine ancestry since she's the direct descendant of the god King Deshret. This therefore makes Candace the very embodiment 
of the divine protection conveyed by an Ankh. This cross also represents eternity, as it is in the shape of a never-ending loop. The concept of eternity is also conveyed in its rarer, Candace. Even though King Deshret died and his civilization collapsed, the memory still lives on eternally with Aru village and the last remnant of his bloodline, Candace. On her back, shield, and even constellation, we have the wings of what seems to be a falcon. Horus, the falcon god, was Egypt's god of war, making sense that his symbols are put on the design of Candace, a warrior herself. Besides him, Horus's mother, Isis, is also referenced in Candace. The crescents that Candace adorns herself with are associated with Isis or Aset, the goddess of healing. This is all the more fitting for Candace as her gameplay specializes her as a support unit that heals her teammates, just like Aset. While strolling across the Sumeru desert, you may have snatched a handful of scarabs. Though they may just look like yellow onikabutos, they actually serve an important role in Egyptian culture. These little beetles were often seen as symbols of creation and life. This is because they use literal dung or nothing to feed their young and foster a new generation of beetles. Though a lowly dung rolling beetle, this symbolization of making everything from nothing made the little critter earn its immortalization on Egyptian jewelry and royal crests. Beyond these smaller symbols, even more aspects of Sumeru point towards the gods of ancient Egypt. Let's start with the former ruler of the Sumeru desert, King Deshret. His portrayal in Genshin Impact is fairly accurate to Egyptian mythology. In Egypt, the term Deshret was used for one of the four main crowns of the kingdom. While others did exist, Deshret referred to the crown of Egypt's northernmost region. This crown had a distinct crimson color, and is often referenced when we figure out King Deshret's Arabic name in Sumeru. His alternative name, Al-Akhmar literally means the Crimson One, just like how Deshret was the red crimson crown of the Lower Nile. While observing the statues placed around King Deshret's former civilization, we see that they are also modeled after ancient Egyptian deities. The statues that stand guard next to the temples and grave sites seem to be men with falcon heads. Just like before, this is another analogy to Horus, the Egyptian god of war. Since he's the Egyptian deity of war and combat, it makes sense that the armed soldiers that stand guard at these ancient cities are modeled after him, with hopes of using his warlike strength in combat. Another statue we see in the desert is what looks like to be a cat, or a lion, with wings. This is most likely Bastet, the Egyptian goddess of cats. During their time, cats were used as a pest control option, so it makes sense that these statues of pest-killing cats would be placed at the entrance of cities to keep them clean. If you're wondering where her wings came from, it's because Bastet would sometimes fuse with Sekhmet, the goddess of the desert sun. When looking at the eastern part of the Sumeru desert, you may notice the Setech regions. These are named after the Egyptian god Setech. He was the god of the desert, which is fitting considering the fact that one of our bosses, the lord of the desert, is located in the region named after him. Also, as the god of evil and hostilities, it makes sense that the giant ruin guard that tries to kill you every time is located in his respective region. Our last comparison to Egyptian gods runs even deeper. This jackal deity is often seen in both statues as well as Sino, our favorite dad joke-telling comedian. You see, he was based on the Egyptian god of Anubis, perhaps one of the most well-known deities besides Ra and Horus. Anubis was the god of judgment, specifically the judgment of dead souls. This ties in with Sino, since he often cites his violent line of work against evildoers as his form of judgment. Another responsibility of Anubis was to guide dead souls to the Hall of Judgment to determine how they will be treated based upon their actions and their life. Likewise, statues of Anubis are built in halls underneath the burial sites in Sumeru, alluding to this mythical necropolis. Moving on from their religious pantheon, another notable aspect of ancient Egypt is referenced in Sumeru, that being their advancements. These societal advancements, however, would be nothing without the Nile River. Most of us know that the source of Egypt's life has always been the Nile, as it nourished not only their crops, but also their machines in an empty desert. Likewise, certain parts of the Sumeru Desert also seem to hint at the existence of a long-gone Nile River. You see, in the deserts of Handramaveth, you may notice that its terrain is drastically uneven. One of the creases within this massive spiral of stone and sand is a location known as the Moon Blue Canals, which perhaps has a hidden connection to Egyptian history. In the game's archive section, it says that this was the place of convergence for the three main rivers that gave life to King Deshret's old civilization. In Egypt, the convergence at the Nile River also gave life to their civilization. Furthermore, this theory that a Nile River once flowed through Sumeru is proven by the fact that King Deshret had an Egyptian solar barge, in spite of there being no large bodies of water in the desert besides small oases. This implies that he once used it in a pre-existent river. Most of all, the geography of the Great Nile River is replicated in Sumeru. This is because 
Ironically, the northern lands of Egypt were called the Lower Nile, while the southern lands of Egypt were called the Upper Nile. Why is it that the upper is down here and lower is up there. We see the same phenomena in Sumeru. The land of Lower Setek is up north, while the land of Upper Setek is down south. This strange similarity between Sumerian and Egyptian geography all goes back to the Nile River. You see, the Nile River flowed from the south to the north. Any direction that a river flows towards is known as downstream. This is why, even though the Nile flowed up north, the northern lands that it flowed to were still considered downstream. Hence the reason why the directions were swapped, and the northern lands are called the Lower Nile. But how is this similarity connected to in Sumeru? This may be another hint for the existence of an equivalent of the Nile River in Sumeru. This is because of the Valley of Dahri formed in the Upper Setek region. It is very likely that a river started here in this region and carved through the rock in a thousand year process of erosion. If we continue our journey through this imaginary river line, we notice that it leads to this depression right here in the desert. Just like the Valley of Dahri, this low point could have been carved out by that former river. This river would presumably end north, near the lowlands of Setek, where it flowed downstream. After all, the unique rock formations in Lower Setek may have been formed by the river that once flowed there. Of course, this is just a theory for the existence of a former Nile River in Sumeru. But seeing the construction of temples around the area where the river would have been flowing is pretty fitting. This is because Egyptians also built their famous temples, such as the Luxor and others, next to this prime body of water. Though it is the native Egyptian dynasties that built the pyramids and temples of the country, other kingdoms and dynasties in and around Egypt are also referenced in Sumeru. Take Candace for example. Her name comes from the term Kandake. This was a title given to the sister of the king that once ruled the ancient Kush kingdom that existed in what is now southern Egypt and Sudan. As a matriarchal society, it was the Kandake who was responsible for succeeding the king and running the Kushites if anything were to happen to him. We see this too in Candace. Just like how the Kandake was responsible for succeeding a dead king in protecting her kingdom, Candace succeeded her dead ancestor, King Deshra, in protecting the people of Aru village, who are the last remnants of his civilization. Furthermore, the Sudanese Kush kingdom also has other references besides Candace's name. The thick trees we see in the Sumeru desert are modeled after the baobab trees found in Sudan. These trees are iconic in symbolizing African wildlife and are often used to embody the theme of positivity as they are forms of life capable of surviving in the harsh desert where nothing else can. However, just like China, Egypt will go through many different dynasties. Some would be ruled by people who are not natively Egyptian. These include a Greek Ptolemaic dynasty as well as the older Persian dynasty of Egypt. But what Greek and Persian influences do we see in Egypt? If we visit the Hadramaveth Desert, you may notice that there are still Egyptian-like ruins in the area. However, the mountain at the center, Mount Damavand, does not have an Egyptian name. Rather, it has a Persian or Iranian name, since Mount Damavand is an actual mountain in Persia. This therefore references the Persian influences left by the Achaemenid Empire during their occupation of Egypt. As for Greek influences, we see them mostly in the characters themselves. Sino, although taking heavy inspiration from Egyptian mythology, has a Greek name, since Sino comes from the ancient Greek root word for dog. Also, Port Ormos is a combination of both Greek and Persian. The Greek word Ormos means small bay, which is pretty self-explanatory. Meanwhile, the Strait of Hormuz was another valuable location for the Persian Empire that once ruled Egypt. Of course, you can't represent different cultures without mentioning their unique foods. Some of the dishes in Sumeru correspond to Egyptian culture. Take Aru mixed rice for example, as well as Candace's specialty dish, utmost care. These dishes are specifically based on the national dish of the country, kulshari. Just like in Egypt, these two foods use staple Egyptian ingredients such as rice, garbanzo beans, and tomato sauce as a topping. Kulshari and Aru mixed rice even share similar origins. Just like how Aru mixed rice was known for its low cost, Kulshari too was known as the food of the poor. In addition to Kulshari, we also have the Puspa Cafe in Sumeru City. In comparison to the other establishments like the Angel's Share or the Komori Tea House, this is the only eatery in the game that really emphasizes the enjoyment of coffee. But why put the restaurant famous for coffee in Sumeru when it could have been placed anywhere else in Tevat? The truth is, countries like Egypt have a long history of coffee culture, though it is a bit more modern than ancient Egypt, Sufi Muslims from the Arabian Peninsula brought their coffee culture to Egypt during the 16th century, where they would use it as a drink between prayers. During your time in Sumeru, you may have noticed something unique about Aru village. 
Instead of being built on a body of water, or on a hill like most villages, it is built within the ground, and within what seems to be a giant cave, or canyon. Even much of the houses and rooms don't seem to be built outside, but rather into the earth itself. This choice to make Aru village a cave village does not seem coincidental if you study the architecture of North Africa. In the dry deserts of Tunisia, the native Amazigh people similarly built cave villages into the ground. But why did they? By placing their homes into the earth rather than above it. The soil above and around their rooms act as natural insulation. This keeps them cool during hot desert days, but warm during freezing desert nights. Furthermore, the fortress that protects the border between the Sumeru Desert and forest also has references to Tunisian architecture. North Africa was not always Arabic, but while the Arabs from Asia were conquering the region, they set up small forts that were called ribats. In Arabic, a ribat is a small fortress used to house volunteer soldiers, much like how Caravan Ribat in Sumeru is used to house volunteer Aramite soldiers. Likewise, Ribats in Tunisia were also used as checkpoints, or caravanserais, for traveling merchants to rest. We see this too in Sumeru, as merchants in Caravan Ribat traveling between the desert and forest use this place to rest, shop, and even eat, just like a caravanserai. For our last comparison to North Africa, Let's take a look at how the indigenous peoples of North Africa are represented in Sumeru. Though Arabs may come to mind when we think of the region, the people that were there before them are a group known as the Amazigs, who are also known in the West as Berbers, though they do consider it to be a derogatory term. They are the natives of North African countries such as Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria. The first character to have Amazigh influence is Tainari. Not only is his name of Amazigh origin, but so is his design. Tainari wears a colorful Lassam belt, a common clothing item that Amazigh's wear across the Maghreb desert. His striped jacket matches the ones worn by Amazigh warriors from the Zamor tribe of Morocco. The rest of his influences, however, are from another Amazigh-populated country, Algeria. You see, Tainari is one of our animal characters. Though we already have a mischievous kitsune fox from Japan, his kind of fox is a fennec fox. This is a fox native to the same parts of Africa that the Amazigh's call home and is even the national animal of Algeria. While Miko is tall due to the fact that kitsunes are pretty big foxes, Tainari is pretty short due to the fact that fennec foxes are actually the smallest species of fox. To top it all off, Tainari even has the same green and red color scheme of the Algerian flag, the same countries that both Amazigs and fennec foxes call their home. For our last comparisons to the Amazigs, let's take a look at Dia and her group, the Aramites. Dia was based on a real Amazigh queen, who was also called Dia. Dia was an Amazigh queen who led her people against the Arab Muslims who were trying to conquer Northern Africa. Just like how Dia is a pyro unit in the game, Dia was responsible for using scorched earth tactics. These include burning and destroying installations that could have the capability to be used by the enemy Arabs. After her death, she was often seen as a symbol of Amazigh identity that separated them from the Arabs and later, their French occupiers. The same goes for Dia, as she is the game's playable poster girl for the Aramite people. To top it all off, Dia is often described as a lion, especially in her constellation, as well as her title, the Flame Mane. This is a connection to perhaps the most symbolic animal in Amazigh culture, the Barbary Lion. It is a symbol of strength and pride, something seen in both Aramites and Amazigs. Furthermore, Dia's Barbary Lion is also the national animal of another Amazigh-populated country, Morocco. Speaking of the Aramites, they too could be another allusion to the Amazigh people. I mentioned in my past video that Aramites could have been based on the Bedouin Arabs from the Middle East. However, researching them even more makes them seem connected to the Amazigs as well. Besides Dia, more connections between Amazigs and Aramites are seen in their culture. Just like how Aramites are known as Sumeru's elite mercenaries, so were the Amazigs. Amazigs were often hired for their skill in combat, fighting across multiple regions in Africa and the Middle East. Even modern conflicts like the Second World War still prove the ferocity and skill of Amazigh warriors. In the 1940s, the French government used Amazigh Moroccan soldiers known as Goumiers to fight against the fascist Italian and Germans. Both groups also have a nomadic way of life. Nomads are people who never live in one spot continuously, but rather wander from place to place in the search of resources and safety. Similar to how Amazigs are known as the original nomads of the African desert, so were the Aramites. After all, Aramites were called desert wanderers, just like their African counterparts. Though misconceptions may portray the Amazigs as barbaric, which is where the derogatory term Berber comes from, they do have a heartwarming sense of hospitality. Just like how Amazigs are known for their warm and welcoming personality, so were the Aramites. This is proven when Aramite Dia asks us to pay her in a smile rather than cash for her protection services, or when the people of Aru village welcome us with a cooperative personality rather than a skeptical one.